Welcome to IELTS Easy. Writing 2. Analyzing and reporting. Greater than writing task 1 requires the ability to effectively analyze graphs and or tables or diagrams. This lesson will teach you a system that delivers consistent results. Here are goals for this lesson. Take some time to carefully read them and when you're ready, in this lesson we'll be concentrating on writing task 1. As outlined in the previous lesson, writing task 1 involves writing about a graph, table or diagram. Task 1 questions ask you to summarize the information by selecting and reporting the main features and make comparisons where relevant. Now, to score well in this type of question, you need to include a number of things in your written response. Firstly, your written response must be of an academic standard, both in the way the information is analyzed and in the type of language used. Secondly, your written response must flow from one idea to the next in a clear and logical way. Remember, the way each idea is expressed makes a big impression. Thirdly, a written response is to be an academic interpretation of the information. This kind of interpretation is much more than just a simple restatement of the words written in the question. Lastly, a high-scoring task 1 written response would offer a conclusion which is well supported by the data given in the question. If you're going to achieve these goals, you must approach writing task 1 systematically. That is, you must have a system. Students, our goal is to help you to do your very best in each IELTS module. One of the best ways to learn is to look at where other candidates have gone wrong. The number one reason that candidates don't do well in writing task 1 is they don't understand how to properly analyze and write about the graph, table or diagram that's presented. Even in your native language this can be a difficult thing to do if you haven't done it much before. Often candidates who have poor analysis skills include irrelevant or unimportant details in their answer. They do this instead of focusing on the important issues or key trends. Another error often made is they mechanically repeat the same thing over and over again. I often read sentences like, in 1965 the population increased. In 1966 the population slightly increased. In 1968 the population decreased. In 1969 the population increased again. This is what I call a mechanical description of data. And it will result in a low score. Another common mistake made by candidates is they give opinions or make statements which are not supported by the data in the question. You cannot make assumptions or guesses. You must use only the information that's presented in the question. One other way in which students do poorly is simply in the words they use. The vocabulary used in this type of task is quite specialized and needs to be developed and practiced. Let's now take a look at a system which can help you to avoid many of these problems. Those that do better in academic tests approach them in a consistent and systematic way. Now, let's take a look at a four-step approach to writing task one which will give you improved and more consistent results. On the screen you see two versions of the same system. One for graphs and tables, and the other for diagrams. As you can see, the two systems are basically the same. Only steps two and three are slightly different, depending on the type of question. Let's now take a quick overview of these four steps. The first step is to thoroughly understand the question and the information or subject material that's presented. If you're not really clear on what you've been asked, you'll end up including irrelevant information, which will lower your score. The second step is to take the time to identify trends or processes. If you're presented with a graph or table, you'll be looking for trends. If you're presented with a diagram, you'll be looking for processes. After identifying trends or processes, the third step is to take the information you've learned in steps one and two and write logical conclusions or outcomes. Lastly, having completed the first three steps, you should now plan and write your answer. Notice I say plan your answer before you start to write. You should not start writing on your answer sheet until you have completed these four steps. Starting to write your answer without giving proper attention to these four points will usually lead to a low score. Now, very importantly, you'll need to take notes for each step and you should use your test paper as a worksheet. It is perfectly okay to do this and you'll find there's plenty of room to write down your ideas. 
Writing brief notes on the test paper will help you organize and plan your answer before you actually start writing it in detail on the answer sheet. Now let's take a closer look at each of these four steps. The first step might seem like an obvious one, but before you do anything else, you must be 100% clear on the question and the subject material being asked. It is common for students to include wrong or irrelevant material in their answer because they don't take the time to clearly understand the question. Firstly, read the question carefully and highlight the key words because they'll tell you what the task is about. Next, study the information presented and read all the words. Graph legends, graph axes, headings and notes on a diagram. Pay careful attention to any arrows. Become aware of the flow or direction in which the information or process moves. Again, make sure you clearly understand the subject material. An important word to consider here is scope. Scope is the boundary or limitation of the material presented. The material presented will not be that complex. So it will have certain boundaries. Any answer you write must stay within these boundaries. In other words, everything you write in your answer must be supported by the material in front of you. If you include irrelevant information that cannot be supported or is not represented by what's written in the question, you will lose marks even if your answer is well written. When you feel you have a good grasp of the question, think about how you'll start your answer. Write a sample introduction on the test booklet. Your introduction should clearly identify the subject and scope of the graph, table or diagram. Step 2 is the most difficult one for candidates. This step involves identifying the key information you'll use in the main part of your answer and the all-important conclusion. Let's look at step 2 as it relates to graphs and tables first. In a graph or table, step 2 involves identifying trends in the information given. A trend is a pattern of useful information which can be found by carefully looking at the information. In a graph or table, to find trends, look at the largest segments or highest numbers. Look at the smallest segments or lowest numbers. Look for unusual variations and or groupings of information. Again, as I've mentioned before, your report must be academic. So you must go beyond restating the obvious. Ask yourself, what does this information mean? What information here would be valuable to someone interested in this subject? I'll show you what I mean. Notice the bar graph in front of you. Which are the key areas worthy of comment? Can we see that in 1970? China had the smallest percentage of high school tennis players? It's clear also that the United States had the largest percentage of tennis players in 2000. In addition, we can very quickly see that Japan experienced uniform growth and then dropped off dramatically in 2000. A good example of an unusual variation. Notice the table. We see that the numbers for pharmacy are very similar for both males and females. This is an example of a meaningful grouping. Making mention and commenting on it. In your answer will demonstrate to the examiner that you've been able to interpret the data. Being able to identify such elements in a graph or table is very important. Remember, make sure you base your findings only on the facts before you. Don't add your own ideas. Again, comma. If you present unsupported findings you will lose marks. When you've identified trends in the information, write summary notes of your findings on the test booklet. Now let's look at step 2. As it relates to diagrams. Step 2 for diagrams is a little different. Instead of looking for trends, we'll be identifying processes. A process is a step-by-step -step series of events that produces an outcome. All diagrams have one or more processes that produce some sort of result. In each process, identify the steps. What happens first, second, third and so on. Also, aim to identify the purpose of each process. Again, your report must be academic. So you must go beyond simply restating the obvious. Look at this diagram. We see a series of processes used to produce a completed university assignment. The information starts at the top and flows to the bottom. Firstly we see the arrows show three ways data is collected. And then next, we see the data is assembled. We're looking for what happens first, second, third and so on until the outcome is achieved. Also, aim to identify the purpose of each process. For example, once the data is assembled, it must be evaluated and kept or deleted. 
It may be mentioned in your answer that the purpose of this step in the process is to ensure the information presented in an assignment directly relates to the question. Remember you must stay within the scope or boundaries of what you have been shown. If you write about things that are not presented, you will lose marks when you've determined the key processes. Again, write summary notes of your findings on the test booklet. Step 3 is vital to achieving a good score in writing task 1 but is often done poorly or even completely overlooked by candidates. Your answer must not only include intelligent observations, it should also include a logical conclusion or outcome. To do this, review the summary notes you wrote for step 2. For a graph or table, ask yourself, what is the significance of this information? What are the possible consequences of the trends that have been identified? What important conclusions can I draw from these points? Remember. Any conclusions you make must be supported by the facts you've collected. For a diagram, ask yourself, what is the significance of this diagram? What are the outcomes of the processes that I've identified? What is the overall key outcome or purpose of the presented diagram? Again, your findings must be supported by what you see in front of you. When you've considered these points, write your conclusions or outcomes on the test booklet. All the hard work has now been done, and you should have all the pieces you need to write a good answer. However, before you start writing your answer on the answer sheet, stop and review your notes. Plan the structure of your answer. Give consideration as to how your answer will flow between introduction, findings and conclusion. Through good choice of academic words, your answer should transition smoothly, in a logical sequence, from one idea to the next. Once you've finished your review, you can now start writing on the answer sheet. Write neatly and clearly. Be careful with your spelling. And don't forget in writing task 1, you must write a minimum of 150 words. As you write, think about the words you're using. They must be academic. No slang. No abbreviations. No contractions. Words like I'm, ifs, can't. Write all the words in full. Also, avoid using the same word or phrase too often. When you've finished, take the time to check your answer for errors before moving on. Students, the four-step system I've outlined to you can really make a positive difference to the quality of your writing task 1 answer. Many of the principles in this lesson can also be applied to writing task 2, so make sure you take the time to thoroughly understand them. What else can you do? Well, the work you do in this course must accompany diligent practice in your own time. There is no other way to raise your level of English proficiency. A good system cannot make up for poor understanding of written English or a limited vocabulary. Over the years I've told my students, if you want to improve your written skills, do more reading. Now I pass this advice on to you. Specifically I suggest you read news magazines and professional journals. They often contain graphs and charts and diagrams. And these can be of enormous help. In developing your task 1 skills, professional journals and science publications can also be helpful. As you read the articles, take note of the descriptive vocabulary used, and study the graphs, charts and diagrams. Start building your own list of words specifically for writing task 1. Such a list will be of great benefit to you, both in the test and in your later studies. In the practice lab of this website, you'll see a number of sample tests. With each sample test, I provide a sample answer. And how I came to that answer. I think you'll find this very helpful. Finally, I suggest you check out the IELTS EZ fan page. There you'll find a learning tool that will teach you vocabulary used to describe graphs and charts. Well done. You have now completed this lesson. Before move on to the next lesson, make sure you fully understand the lesson above. I recommend you to review from the beginning. See you in the next lesson.